So. Hello and welcome back to Calculus 1, section 4.6 on linear approximation and differentials. All right, let's honor our ancestors. Uh, this is the way we used to compute values before calculators. Now, this has also, that's application. Uh, it, this can be used in much more powerful ways than just computing values, but uh, it's easy and nice to understand um, the whole idea through computing values. You are going to upgrade this in Calc 2 and then eventually use it in differential equations if you are on the track to take all of those courses. Um, this will be back in a different form in Calc 3 as well, so today's lecture will actually show up in all of your future courses again, and then it will be used in certain engineering stuff uh, later on, but again, this is only used on the high level. The low level stuff that we are going to see now is completely useless to us because we do have technology uh, to actually do this much faster anyway um, what is the idea the idea is you want to compute uh, square root of i don't know 15.6 whatever and uh, you ask yourself what is this it could be any square root that you can come up with it doesn't matter you know what pick whatever number you want so the trick is to find the closest perfect square because your function is a square root uh, to find the closest um, perfect square and then find the tangent line at that value so we'll be looking at a equals 16 actually uh, if i draw square root function and then i say this is my value uh, 16 and I find the tangent line at value 16. Fifteen point seven is right in front, and if you take a look over here, and I can zoom in, the y value of the tangent line and the y value of the original function are very close to each other. They're not the same. They're very close. So I can just use the y value of 15.7 computed in the tangent line, which is easy, rather than computing 15.7 in the original function, which is a square root of 15.7 or ln, right? So it's much easier to compute values in a, in a linear line than in the original function that you that you had so that's the idea of the entire section and uh, eventually this is what gives you the table of values so engineers just 50 years ago used to walk around with a book called log tables and this book was only the book of values it goes like this sine of zero is zero sine of 0 0.1 is 0, 0.00 blah and it goes all the way to 90 for sine and then as engineer you know what to do for cosine and then the next section in the book log of 0 0.000 right and then square root and right so the whole book was just tables of values each one computed by hand using these methods and generally captains of ships you know in 1800s 1700s were going back and forth what are you going to do there's just so many executions you have like the rest is just you sit in a cabin and you compute these things. Right, that's compiled um, tables. So we have uh, now the, um, the method. So we know what we need to do. We need to compute the tangent line at the nice value and then compute our number in the tangent line. And that would give us a good approximation. Well, let's see. So what is my uh, function? My function is square root of x, because it's square root of 1, 15.6. Uh, so we'll go there. And we have that we want to find that tangent line at x equals a, which is 16. Uh, we know how to find the tangent line. We find the slope first, which is f prime. Ugh. 
f prime of x is 1 over 2 root x. So m is the slope computed at 16, which is 1 over 2 times root 16, which is 1 over 8. Square root of 16 is 4 times 2 is 8. Uh, I need my uh, y value. So y value is um, f of uh, 16, which is square root of 16, which is 4. So I have all the specs. y equal mx plus b. m equals 1 over 8. And the point is 16, 4. So y is 4. m is 1 over 8. And uh, x is uh, 16 plus b. So this is uh, 4 equals uh, 2 plus b. b equals 2. And I have my tangent line y equals 1 eighth x plus 2. So this is my tangent line. At Uh, x equals to 16. Now, why? Well, square root of 15.7 is approximately the same as y of 15.7, which is 1 over 8 times 15.7 plus 2. Now, you have to agree that if you don't have the calculator, <coughs> this is something that you would rather do. you would rather divide 15.7 by 8 by hand on a paper, right? Then actually figure out the square root of 15, right? So you just calculate this. Now we are I'm going to cheat and use the calculator to compute this, but it can be done easily on a paper. It's just we're not crazy lazy right now. So we have. 15.7 divided by 8 plus 2 uh, for a total of 3.9625. So our linear approximation says that the square root of 15.7 is approximately 3.9625. Calculator will approximate 15.7 as, so now we're going to actually do this and see. Now this is what you would usually do, so that's why I say it's obsolete to, to do this, but it's okay. Uh, it gives us uh, 3.9623, and we are off on the fourth decimal, right? That's that's ten thousands. We are off by two ten thousands by this calculation. Now everything we did to calculate this value and get such a precise number, right? It's not exact, but it's really close. <coughs> we haven't used we don't have to use any calculator at all. And we are able to like go through and actually figure out a very good value for you know, 15.7. Now, pick your number, because whatever number you pick, you will be able to find a perfect square, that it's the closest, and then do the tangent line at that number, and then have your... Yes. So let's try another one. Uh, the one that I always do would be uh, ln, ln3. Now, ln3 is another value that I always work out. And... Uh, Again, we need to pick a nice value that would work with ln, that it's close to 3. And that is 3. Any time now. What's the nice value that works? Well, ln, ln of 4, we don't know. ln of 2, we don't know. What is the value that we do know? Ellen one. one would be zero, 
but there is a closer value to 3 than that. What is the value of E? Exactly, 2.7. 2818281845906 right that's the it's common out so a equals e so we're going to find the tangent line at e the graph would be like that goes through 1 then we have 2 3 and then there will be E value for our tangent line. And now you can see that the Y value of the tangent line and the uh, Y value for the 3 in original function. So this is the tangent line and this is uh, ln x. Uh, you see that the Y values are very close. So we should have a good approximation here. All right, let's go. My function f of x is ln x my derivative f prime of x is derivative of ln x is uh, one, over x. 1 over x and then we compute the slope which is derivative computed at the value which is um, uh, 1 over e so we have the slope is 1 over e the y value for the function is ln e, which is 1. So I have now uh, y equals mx plus b for the tangent line. m is 1 over e. And the point is e1. So 1 equals 1 over e times e plus b. And uh, uh, b is equal to 0, because e and e would cancel. And then 1 minus 1 is 0, so b is 0. We have y equals x as a tangent line. Uh, please note that my line is actually going through the origin, right? So b is 0. You can also, you know, if you draw these things nicely. So now... What is the ln3? ln3 is approximately the same as y computed at 3. And that is... Oh, hold on. 1 over e times x. I forgot to put in a slope. So that's 1 over e times 3, which is 3 over e, which is approximately 3 over 2.7, which is 30 over 27 which when you cancel, you get uh, 10 over 9, which is approximately 1.11111 forever. So we approximated that ln3 is about 1.1111 forever. Calculator would say that ln3 is approximately, and uh, Let's see what the calculator says. Calculator says ln3 1.0986. Oh, come on, right? <laughs> that's 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 <coughs> one. It's like two cents away. I have two cents. Here's my two cents. I know. <laughs> In engineering, you have 1.5 safety factor. So, there you go. You have you have yeah, another example on how you can cook. So, you know what you can do with this? When Sal says, ah, what do you know? <laughs> I can compute ln5, ln7, ln13.1 <laughs> by hand, right? Using linear approximation with derivatives and tangent lines. So what do you know? Right? See, it's, it's a good, uh, it's a good comeback. Uh, also wonderful 
conversation starter for the upcoming Thanksgiving dinner, right? When everyone is there, uh, you take one of those linen napkins, right? You work it out with a pen on it. You're guaranteed never to be bothered for a stupid holiday again. Just then, play video games in peace, right? It's amazing. Um, you're not happy about that. <laughs> about the comment. <laughs> oh, I'm already past that one. Um. <laughs> Moving on, right? So, what is this entire thing about? It's just about finding the tangent line at the closest convenient point and then uh, approximating the value you actually originally wanted in that tangent line rather than the function you had. Since you will be looking for tangent line in every single problem, uh, wouldn't that be a nice if we had a single line, one formula for the entire tangent line? And the answer is we have that. So we call that linearization because you are replacing your curved functions like e to the x, ln x, tangent x, right? into a linear line, straight line, because that's what a tangent line is. So we call the whole process linearization because you are changing a curved line into a linear line and you are computing in linear line. So linearization will have the formula L of X, that's your Y, your old Y, as F of A plus F prime of A times X minus A. So this is the formula for linearization, but what this actually is, is a single line formula for tangent lines. Where does this come from? Well, if you think about this, uh, you remember the formula y minus y1 is equal to m x minus x1 from algebra? We also know that uh, f of x is y, which means that uh, y1 would be f of x1. Are we all bueno on that one? So if you realize that this one over here is your y1, and you move it to the other side, you have y minus y1, right? And look what you have on the right-hand side. You have the derivative of, that's the slope m, and then you have x minus x1, x minus a. So this is just standard algebra equation for the line, and we just <coughs> placed in all of the pre-calculus and calculus features inside. Instead of dealing with single points, we just placed in functions so we can deal with the stuff that we have. So you, you replace this y1 with f of a, move it to the other side, this is your derivative, and then there's your a at which you are computing things, and we're done. This formula is the one that will be upgraded in Calc 2 to a formula that will have infinitely many terms and we'll call it power series and um, it will be a way to turn any curve into a whole bunch of polynomials simplifying your life greatly you will be so powerful in, in, in chapter 9 right? it will be unstoppable because you will be able to take a function and turn it into a polynomial and what do you know about derivatives and integrals of polynomials? Well, you don't know integrals yet, but derivatives and integrals of polynomials. Joke to compute, right? So, uh, this is the first step towards getting that power. Yes? Are we in the point in computer science when then we can optimize the best polynomial for some given curve? Or so say at this point we should be using the script to evaluate this? Kind of how, how you would like yeah, well, we're not doing that. Statistics is basically concerned with regression and uh, yeah. feeding back curves and so on. So that's more of a statistics thing than, uh, than what we do here. Okay. All right, so um, should we... Let's do one more example of this and then maybe crank it in this formula. I just want to uh, take a look at... Uh, uh, example from the book for that. So 
So linearization, uh, they want you to compute Uh, cosine of 0 0.8 cosine of 0 0.8 now cosine of 0 0.8 they already gave you radians uh, maybe it will be worthwhile for you to, to put a little note there saying that sines and cosines must be in radians so if they give you 30 degrees you're doomed right you have to convert it uh, into radians so all of these uh, sine, cosine, tangent, whatever, uh, trig ones, uh, they need to be done in radians if you're doing linearization. So now my question to you is how much is cosine of 0 0.8 radians? And you should just be looking at me like, huh, what? Right? So the goal is to find which of the nice values pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, right, something from those, uh, will be close to, to 0 0.8. So play on your calculator, right? This is the time when you divide pi by, by 3, pi by 4, pi by 2, pi by 6, right, and see which one of those will get you the closest to 0 0.8. That's the magic number at which you are looking for the tangent line. So your job is to your job is to find that value. Um, if your calculators don't have pi, you can do 3.14, sure. Uh, you can use your cell phones, just uh, flip them sideways. Even the iPhones can, can do that. Uh, flip them sideways, they will give you more options, and then you will have pi. Do you have a calculator? What was the So you need to tell me now, are we going to use zero? Pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, or pi over 2. Which one do we get to use? Yes? Pi over 4. Pi over 4. Very good. So, you know that you can compute your cosine, right? You can compute your cosine for 0, pi over 6, which is 30 degrees, pi over 4, which is 45 degrees, pi over 3, which is 60 degrees, pi over 2, which is 90 degrees. This is your first quadrant. Just the only important angles because the reference angles collapse to these ones. So as you run these calculations in your calculator, only one of these five numbers will be closest to 0 0.8. Well, it's clearly not 0, so throw that one in garbage. But then you have all the others. So you go pi divided by 6. Pi divided by 4. And it turns out that pi over 4 is the value that it's closest to 0 0.8. So we will pick that one because it's closest to 0 0.8. Great. So that means that I'll need to do the tangent line at pi over 4. All right, let's use our linearization formula, which is uh, f of a uh, plus derivative at a x minus a. Well, a is pi over 4. We know that. Uh, function is cosine x, and the derivative of uh, that function is negative sine x. So all I need to do is to plug everything in. L of x is equal to f of a, that's cosine of pi over 4, plus the derivative, so that's negative sine of pi over 4, times x minus pi over 4. So this is what I need to work out. Okay, well, we can, we can deal with this. Uh, cosine is root 2 over 2. Sine is also root 2 over 2. And then I have times x minus pi over 4. Uh, this is already a tangent line. We're done. All I need to do is now to say that cosine of 0 0.8 
is approximately the same as L computed at 0 0.8, which is root 2 over 2 minus root 2 over 2, open parenthesis, 0 0.8 minus pi over 4. Now you can run these calculations in your uh, in uh, as estimates, right? Keep each root two as a 1.4, and then right you will go through through all of these calculations. I'm just going to use the calculator to quickly plow through this. Square root of two divided by two minus another square root of two divided by two times uh, 0 0.8 minus pi divided by 4, close parenthesis, and enter. So my calculation here gives me approximately 0 0.6968. And the calculator will say cosine of 0 0.8 is I just need to make sure first that I am in radians. I am. So cosine 0 0.8 calculator version is 0 0.6967. One ten thousand off. This is how good these approximations are. And then you will learn that if you later in Calc 2 you're approximating functions, all you need is like four terms off of the polynomial. That equality happens when you use infinitely many polynomials. You chop it just to four, four first four, and you have immediately amazing approximation. So this is the first part of the lecture. Technically, this is just the application of a tangent line so that we can compute values. It works for trig, for ease, for lns, for square roots, cube roots, uh, all of those things. And in the textbook you have problems 25 to 36 to practice this. The only thing that really despise is that they give you the value that you should look at. So when I gave you this cosine problem, I omitted pi over 4. I omitted that because uh, you are supposed to find the value. Remember that you know square numbers, right? So if I'm working with a square root and I give you 9.3, well, you're going to use 9. If I give you 98, you're going to use 10 because it's 100, right? So now also for sines and cosines and tangents, you only have the five basic numbers, 0 through pi over 2. And whatever value they gave you is going to be closest to one of them, right? So, and if it's in the middle exactly between the two, then just pick either one, it doesn't matter. So this is the first half of our lecture uh, on linearization. Second part is on differentials. Now, differentials are a little bit different creatures. Differentials approximate uh, the change. I did mention in this class at one point and at the beginning that you know you are the, the lightest and tallest for the day when you wake up and then as you go through the day <coughs> you would be eating which means the body weight is about to increase or and as you are walking, the, the body weight compresses the joints ever so slightly, so you are shorter by the end of the day, right? So that's the, that's the part. That's why they say, you know, children grow in sleep. You know, kids need to sleep as much as possible when they're, right, young. Well, it's multi-purpose, right? One, first, you won't have some peace. Uh, and the second of all, they grow, right? Because that's when they expand the most. Um, so... If you are to uh, observe a system um, that changes, that system will either grow or shrink. So the size, the volume, the surface area, something there increases. <coughs> um, and this is one of the central parts that we use 
to design stuff. If you ever driven over the, those bridges leading to New York where you have to pay like 20 bucks in a firstborn child or a kidney, I don't know, whatever it was they, they take when you go across, uh, you've seen those connections, right, for the bridge that are on the, on the ground. Yeah, they, they look like that, right? Except that you drive over them. Yeah. Like, wh why are they there? As the heat. And moisture. And moisture, yes. So, in the summer, they're closed. In the winter, they're open, right? You can't fall through them with a car because it's only six inch opening. But any bigger bridge is always going to have those, uh, those gaps. Another, another example, train tracks, same thing. You know, when you, drive, when you ride the, the train in the winter, you always go and the, the train is a lot of noise. The tuck, 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 as it goes. Why? Because the cold, right, the rails are very long. So technically, if you are to heat them up, which they do in the, in the, in the summer, they expand, but they expand in length. So if you don't leave a gap for that expansion to fill the gap, they will push against each other and they will just pop up. That's actually, you can find black and white images on Google from, you know, 200 years ago, where, you know, when they were building the railroad for the first time, you have them all twisted and, and right? Because that's exactly what happened. So you have to leave a gap. That gap disappears in the summer. Ride is smooth. There is no tuck, 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 right? And you get these tucks as the, as the wheels pass over the gap, right? <laughs> and it's always two tacks together, tuck, 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 because every set of wheels are always two wheels, right? In the front and then two wheels in the back. And as they pass over it, you get the sound. And it's always the same sound. Uh, if you focus on it, right, it will drive you crazy. <laughs> so um, design of that for instance. Uh, then bridges. Um, another uh, one that I always use is uh, design uh, of... Uh, I used to use the CDs, but you don't know what that is. The Blu-ray, right? Uh, Blu-ray discs for, for movies. Right? How they work. You have the laser that reads, right? Now what happens when you hit the laser into the plastic disc? What happens? What happens to the disc as laser is reading? Well, the disc spins, yes. No, I'm not asking how the laser and how does it. I'm asking what is happening to the disc as the laser is hitting it to read. It's degrading to the heat or something? It's heating up. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> it's heating up. Every time, if you, if you are to interrupt the, uh, I was about to say music again. They used to put music on those kind of things, and people used to There's carry no them. Use them. We're not that. Old. <laughs> or the young, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> not that young. People, I actually ripped the CD yesterday, so yeah. uh, like I am that old. Um, Every time you run the magnetic bar over the strip. It changes a little bit because it's an analog format for some reason. Yeah, um, it's magnetic. Same thing. You don't want strong magnets around your credit card. You magnetize it the strip. Well, now they have the chip. It doesn't work half the time anyway. Yeah. So, really? of course. You go to quick check. You can't even. You have to swipe your card. Yeah, I thought there was something different. wrong with my account. I go no, to. Uh, I go to Shoprite and say card is declined. I'm saying well, I don't know why. Then I go to gas station when they actually swipe it, and it works fine. You probably have a scratch chip. Uh, uh, Quick check has not updated all the software across the board. Yeah. So, anyway, so um, design of this. So, when you have the, this disc playing in a player, it spins, right? The laser reads, it gets it hot, it will expand slightly. Well, when it expands, the location where the stuff is is moved, right? So you have to have temperature probes and you have to have all of these kind of things that will compute how much of expansion of the plastic disc happened due to heat, excessive heat from the laser. Uh, and then your data will not skip. I mean, you will have the full packages, right? There will be no loss in data and then there will be no 
uh, broken uh, music or whatever. So these differentials, again, um, will approximate the change or how much the surface area changes, the volume changes, the length of the side. So this is not your related rates, right? Related rates were calculating the change of volume in respect to change of a side. This approximates the change itself. So if I have, um, well, we can also talk about tire pressure and all of that stuff due to temperature, right? In the summer, you need to have lower pressure than the winter um, because there is less heat and so on. So what are we talking about? If I have, let's say, um, a circle of a radius R, and then that radius expands a little bit to R1, then the, then the area of the circle would expand. Now, you see, the trick is that you have area that changes into area 1, so delta change is area 1 minus area which is new minus old. And this is exact. Now, we are going back to the time when there were no calculators. So you don't want to compute these things directly in those times. Today you obviously won't. In those times you didn't. So we use what we call differentials. And differentials are really neat. Look at this. Uh, you have y equal f of x. And you take derivative of both sides. On the left hand side you will have dy dx written as Leibniz notation. On the other side is a modified Newton's notation f prime of x. And then you move dx to the other side and you get dy is equal to f prime of x dx. This is the differential formula. Should have boxed this red. This is differential. Literally one step to derive this thing. And now you need to understand that dx is exactly the same as delta x, which is x2 minus x1, which is new minus old. And the change in y is approximated by dy. And dy is equal to f prime of x times the, uh, d dx, delta x. So if I want to know the change... I don't, know, I don't want to know the values. I just want to know the change. Then we can do it with the differential. So, so have this circle. Let the radius of the circle grow from r equals to 3 to let's say 3.4 approximate the change in area of the circle so we have a circle with radius 3 and then you heat it up the radius will grow because the entire circle expands the radius grows from 3 to 3.4. Well, that means that the area of the circle grew as well. And, this, and the only thing that differential over here is detecting is by how much. That's the only thing that we care about. So, we will start with the area of the circle as pi r squared. And I'm going to uh, differentiate this in respect to R.
to get the ADR as 2 pi r on the other end. And then I move dr to the other side to get my differential for this particular problem to be this. We can compute our dr, which is delta r, which is 3.4 new minus 3, which is old, which is 0 0.4. And we know that the radius starts at 3. Plug in. We have the change, the del uh, delta, no delta, sorry, dA is equal to 2 pi times 3 times 0 0.4, which is 2.4 pi. If you use pi to be uh, 3.14, times 2.4, seven point, about 7.5. So now, the change in area, which is exact, is approximated by dA, which is about 7.5. So if the radius grows, let's say 0.4 inches, the area will grow by 7.5 inches squared. So that's what, so this is only giving us the dif difference, right? It didn't tell us anything about how much the actual area or the new area is or anything like that. This just tells us uh, the, the difference uh, and how much. The new. Now, again, we are in 21st century now, we think we have cool technology. Well, definitely have a cool technology than 50 years ago. We can actually calculate the exact area, right? We can calculate the exact change by calculating A2 minus A1, because we have calculators. So that will be pi times 3.4 squared minus pi times 3 squared, right? That's all we need to punch in our calculator and we'll get the exact change. So I have pi, open parenthesis, 3.4 squared minus 9, 8.04, right? So that's exact. I mean, it's still, I, I cut off a lot of decimals. There's a pi there. But, you know, we're about 50 cents off on this one. That's more than we are used to. But again, it's not the end of the world. I mean, we got to approximate stuff and not use calculator at all and all of those good things. That's what the differentials are. And uh, they, are, uh, they have error in driving speed, ideal gas law with uh, pressure and temperature, right? Which you can use for your tires. Uh, approximating change the volume of a sphere, approximate change of atmospheric pressure when the altitude increases from Z uh, 2 kilometers to Z 2.01 kilometers, and they give you the formula for pressure, uh, it's exponential one. Another change in volume. Um, Can you notice this, I'm sorry? Where is that? This is all in, I'm reading of the textbook, page 300 in a new version of the book. Oh. Uh, but whatever the section is, I believe 3.5, uh, 4.5 in the old book, and then in the word problems. But see, the new book has more problems. I, I believe that the old book had only two problems. This one has six. So uh, they added a lot of problems in the new edition, which is great. So page 300 um, has uh, differential problems. Uh, 55 to 60 uh, are all differential problems perks of the new edition, right? So, you can try and compute some of these, uh, bring them next class uh, if you have questions, obviously, and we'll deal with that. Are we going to get um, the new version of one? Did you get the code for that? Uh, no, that's the, well, I got the old codes, because you will be upgraded at, at when the course ends.
Well, let me just say, so this is it. We'll, we'll take a short break and then we'll do the next section. Bye.